tonight's event is really, the goal is really to create a safe space for this open dialogue uh, around the impact of racial inequality and injustices in our communities. We're going to share feelings, stories, and solutions that promote understanding, empathy, and build community between people of different backgrounds, cultures, and ethnicities in the city of Beverly. Um, we're proposing to do that by engaging with our two amazing panelists who I'm about to introduce, and also by engaging with you, by hearing your stories. Um, and in order to do that, in order to be really build a safe space, um, we all need to come. I would ask that we all be here with curiosity and open ears, open hearts, to listen fully to our speakers, listen fully to attendees who share their stories with us. Uh, you will have a chance for open dialogue at, after we hear from our panelists um, to share a story, share, share a five minute story about your experiences in, in, in this community around race and anti-racism and acceptance. Um, and you'll have a chance to ask questions of our panelists. Um, I will ask your permission as the moderator to uh, keep the conversation rolling. So that might mean to um, support um, unheard voices, to um, gently bring us back on track, and to ask questions myself with your permission. I would ask you to come with um, a ready to listen and with an open mind and curiosity. So with those kind of ground rules in place, I would like to introduce our panelists. I'm really honored to virtually meet Juan Cofield this evening. Um, Mr. Cofield is serving his eighth term as president of the New England Area Conference of the NAACP. And uh, NIAC is the governing and coordinating entity for NAACP branches in the states of Massachusetts, Rhode Island, New Hampshire, Maine, and Vermont. Um, and I have heard that Juan was a great, is a great leader in helping build our, found our North Shore chapter of the NAACP. And I'm very grateful for that. Um, in Juan's advocacy efforts, he has done, he has led many efforts over the years that include increasing access to life-saving medicine. Um, among the, I'm sorry, I just lost my notes here. Okay, Incre increasing access and awareness to life-saving medicine for the African-American community who are dealing with heart failure. Um, also, helping to establish the New England Civil Rights Hall of Fame in June 2008. Um, Juan has focused on NIAC's advocacy on closing the education gap and educational achievement for all students as an attainable goal. This activism led Juan to and NIAC to become actively involved in Save Our Public in the Save Our Public Schools Committee, the statewide campaign to prevent the passage of the referendum question to expand charter schools in Massachusetts. You may remember that on the 2016 ballot. He was voted chair of the campaign committee, which was enormously successful and responsible for organizing um, to the nth degree, many uh, labor unions, civil rights organizations, and now the educational activism is to improve the underperforming schools throughout the state where most of these schools are in black communities or low income communities. So thank you Juan for being here tonight and bringing all your expertise with you. Thank you. Our second, yeah, thank you, good evening. Our other panelist is Julie Flowers. 
Julie Flowers is one of the ministers who serves at First Baptist Church here in Beverly. And she is also a second term city councilor at large for the city of Beverly. I have the honor of working with her regularly. Julie graduated from Wesley College, Wesley College in 2001 with a BA in Spanish and English, completed her Master's of Divinity at Harvard Divinity School in 2007. She decided to run for office in Beverly in 2017, and she has found serving her community in that way to be a great parallel to the work that she does for community building and support in her day job as well. She lives in Beverly with her son, Emmett, her dog, Genevieve, and their guinea pig, Lucy. Welcome to the evening, Julie Flowers. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, let me change my settings so I can see both of you. Great. So I have, I, we're going to start the evening with just a couple of questions to the panelists, which will get the conversation rolling. Um, and please, panelists, if the question sparks um, a story from your own experiences that you feel we are well known in the social justice circles and your resume is extensive, um, can you tell us more about why it was so important to charter a chapter here in the North Shore for the NAACP? Well, we respond to inquiries and solicitations from residents of an area. Uh, we do not go into an area and ask people to form a branch and it's a, branches and not chapters. Uh, okay. we, we do not go in and ask them. Uh, and we ha I had an initial uh, inquiry from uh, Natalie Bowers, who's now president of the North Shore branch uh, and that led to, uh, it was clear that she had a personal interest and she had been in conversation with a number of other uh, residents in the area and they felt there was a strong need and an interest and uh, it went from there. So the, for the most part, I'm sure that there may be some areas, but that's not been the case in, in uh, my work uh, it, it, the interest, uh, is expressed by residents as opposed to the reverse of that. That's excellent. I was, I was aware that the residents were, um, were interested, but not aware that that was a required kind of. Oh, oh I didn't, I didn't mean to suggest that it's required. <coughs> Excuse me. That's, that's been my experience. Um, uh, there are maybe some other state conferences in which they, there has been a recognition uh, of a real need uh, and it may have been initiated by the state conference, but that's not been the case. And we've now, under my leadership, boy, we've uh, chartered, I think, uh, I'm trying to think, four or five uh, branches uh, within NEAC's jurisdiction. And and I, I will say NEAC, NEAC is the acronym for a New England Area Conference. I'm so used to saying NEAC. So hopefully everybody will understand. Thank you for that. And what do you think um, one of the, the biggest challenges to a, a new branch is? And, and maybe specifically a new branch in New England of the NAACP? It's probably not very different. Uh, New England maybe is not very different than other areas of the country, uh, but my only experience has been in uh, New England. Um, and in the case with the North Shore branch, uh, some branches, there are a number of, of towns and communities in the North Shore branch I think the number is around 15. Uh, and, and we found that many of the residents, the members did not know each other. That's not always the case. Uh, oftentimes there is a, a core com community or city and many of the residents have been, members have been 
active in the community and they know each other. So getting to know each other, um, uh, spreading the word and attaining members. And I must say that the, the, the core group uh, did an extraordinary job in such a short time of building a membership base. Um, and the other area is the North Shore is, is different from many branches within NEAC uh, in that there is not much diversity in many of the communities uh, in the North Shore jurisdiction, branch jurisdiction. Uh, and so there continues to be some awareness as to a, a problem, or, or, uh, I don't know if I'd say problem, but, but, but a, an effort to make the members and the broader community really aware uh, of the problems of systemic racism. So that's what they are clearly working on and, and an interest in helping to solve the problem. Thank you for that insight. Yes. I, um, I'm so, I, I feel like I could probably ask you a thousand questions about your experiences <laughs> in um, NIAC and all of the other mm -hmm. chat, um, branches that you've helped to start, but um, I'll try and leave it to those two for now. And um, I'll have Counselor Flowers, or I can call you Julie Flowers in this setting. Um, answer a couple questions as well. Um, Before you get to Ms. Flowers, let me let me be clear because I don't want to mislead you in terms okay. of branches. And th there are several categories of membership in the NACP. Adult okay. units, units is a generic term. Adult units are branches. There is such a thing as college, as, as, as chapters, but those are youth units. They're college chapters and they're high school chapters. But in, in reference to what we were discussing, uh, which are adult units, and they are all branches. OK, okay. that's okay. great. And I, I uh, made sure to actually sign up for my membership before this evening. So <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. No time like the present. I that, that's right. I, I think <laughs> it seemed like the right thing to do at this point. Wonderful. Um, Stop, stop putting it off, you know? So, wow. and I believe actually it's already been, the link has already been placed in the chat if you're, if you have not become a member yet, the link. I, I, I don't know who has the biggest yeah. grin, I don't know who has the biggest grin on their face, me or the branch president, Natalie Bowers. <laughs> <laughs> Equal grinning. All right. <laughs> <laughs> we like that. That's a good way to start with grin. Um, so, Counselor Flowers, I have a question for you as well. Um, and like I said, please, if you if these questions spark stories that you that come to your mind, please share them with us. We'll keep them as inspiration and also to just expand our minds. Um, so you have become a force in Beverly. For so I don't know if it. I don't think this is a recent thing, but you have become a force in Beverly for social justice and equality, both as a city councilor and as a reverend. Um, tell us more about the work that you as a counselor and, you know, as a reverend um, are doing to really kind of create social justice change here in Beverly, knowing that change is happening, even if it feels slow, but um, where where is your focus? Where are your your steps right now? Um, thank you, Estelle, or Councillor Rand. I'm not sure which titles we should be using right now. Um, <laughs> well, first, I just want to say um, thank you. That's a really kind way to be broached in this in this question. Um, but I also feel um, I also just want to be very cautious about claiming that um, that I alone be some kind of a force for social justice, especially with so many I see, as I was scrolling through the faces, I see so many community forces for social justice here on this call. And I think, you know, that's the first thing that came to mind for me, Estelle, as you were asking the question that 
I, what I really understand about the work of social justice work, which, um, you know, I, I think I've been fortunate to serve a church community, First Baptist on Cabot Street, before I became an elected official that was already deeply committed to, to social justice work. And so that's sort of knit into the DNA of that faith community. Um, and many of our faith communities here in Beverly, actually, we're very fortunate to have uh, many really socially active um, justice seeking faith communities. And we are one of those. Um, and what I have learned in that work and what I learned, you know, being part of that group is that it really takes, it's, it's about all of us working towards how we want to see our community be and become. And so I think for myself, I apply that equally to, you know, as we're talking, as we've been talking in Beverly, as we've been broaching these topics and entering into these conversations about um, racial equity and justice and about what it is to really strive to become an actively anti-racist community, which, you know, I think are conversations that our, our community has really begun, just begun having in earnest. And I, I regret that we haven't had them sooner, but I'm grateful that we're having them now. And so I think it takes, you know, it takes all of us. That's part of, I think, what's so beautiful about being here tonight in this space um, is having this opportunity where, where we can all be together. And it's you know, truly an honor to be on the panel with Mr. Cofield and um, hear about the work that he's done and is doing and um, talk about a force for social justice for sure. So, you know, I, I'm going to, I guess, borrow from a phrase that, um, as I have a nine-year-old, who is, attends one of Beverly's public schools. He attends Hannah's school. And um, his principal, Gabriel Montevecchi, is, is a principal who's deeply um, interested in the work of doing active anti-racism work and helping our children to do that work and helping to make sure that our children and their families see themselves reflected um, in our schools and in our community. And I do want to know, I saw, I noticed Dr. Um, Andre Morgan is on the call, who is the Beverly Public Schools new Director of Opportunity and Access and Equity. So I, Dr. Morgan, we haven't met yet, but I'm just so happy to welcome you to Beverly. Um, but I have heard uh, Mrs. Montevecchi talk when it comes to topics about race and racial justice and equity. Um, she is really careful to talk about herself as a lead learner. And I think what she means by that is that none of us, particularly, you know, those of us who have lived with white privilege and in a system that has privileged us. And I, this is, I include myself in this. That's why I want to be cautious and just sort of frame it this way. We're not the experts with all the solutions. I'm not the expert with all the solutions, but I'm willing to learn. I want to learn. Um, I think I want to be really open to the work and what it will take. I, I think about in front of our church right now, we have a banner. It's a quote from Angela Davis, um, which I, and more recently people might be familiar. I think Ibram Kendi has a very similar um, way of, of wording the work of anti-racism, but our banner says in, in a racist society, it's not enough to be non-racist. We have to be anti-racist. And I think about Ibram Kendi who says, we, there's, not, there's not racist or not racist. Um, it's really racist or anti-racist. And so in, in that regard, I see a big part of our work, especially those of us on this call and in our communities who are white, is being willing to do that work and to listen to and to um, center the experiences of our friends and neighbors of color. Um, I, you know, I often field questions like, how welcoming do you think Beverly is? And, and I always say, you know what, I can't really answer that because to me as a white woman, it feels pretty welcoming, but I want to make sure that I listen to what my friends and neighbors of color are saying because they're the experts of their experience. And I believe our community can do better when we help to really listen and to center. Um, so I think, you know, that's, that's where I hope that we can go together is really to learn and to be brave in this work and to be, Bold, you know, Stella, you opened by have, talking about coming with an open heart and mind and, um, and being courageous and brave and respectful. And I, I believe all those things. And I think, especially for those of us whom the system has privileged to also, to also know that when we engage in 
in the work of anti-racism and striving to learn and do better, we will make mistakes. We will get it wrong. And I think the, what I have really been thinking about is that a big part of that work then for us, if we truly want to build an anti-racist community is to not back away the first time that we do that the first time that we get it wrong, because it's it's even, it's our privilege that would allow us to do that, to shut down the conversation, um, but instead to be able to be corrected, to learn, to listen, um, and to strive to do better. So I, I'm glad to be here in this conversation. I think these are the kinds of conversations I hope our communities can continue to have. And I'm grateful for the, the work and the presence of the NAACP here in our area. And I'm, I'm excited to see where this can go. Thank you, Julie. And Thank those, you. I, I always learn so much from you when um, you speak about um, being a learner and making mistakes and moving forward um, from those mistakes. I, and I want to actually pull in a little bit. I want to pull in a question. And Mayor Cahill, if you wouldn't mind being part of the, um, you know, joining the panel for a moment to help answer this question. I would love that. Um, so I want to pull in the vision of the NAACP, which is that the overall vision is that all individuals have equal rights without discrimination based on race. Um, pretty straightforward and simple, and I'm sure it took months to get to that perfect vision, um, just in terms of the wording. Uh, and I'm sure it was it was a huge learning process. Um, and I, I love the, I'm learning about the six game changers as part of the NAACP kind of platform in terms of moving forward with justice work. But just taking that one vision, all individuals have equal rights without discrimination based on race. I wanna ask you, the panelists, what does our community look and feel like when we have reached that vision? What does it look like when we have that, when, when we've hit that point, when we've worked on the six game changers of economic stability, education, health, public safety and criminal justice, voting rights and political representation and expanding youth and young adult engagement? What are, what, I want you to imagine and give yourself, you know, a 10 second brainstorm. Imagining that those things are in place and, and what floats to the surface for you when you think about your specific community, maybe one, you have so much engagement across New England, pick a community in particular. Um, and, and Julie and Mayor Cahill, you're both centered here in Beverly, what floats to the surface for you as being markedly different when we've reached that vision? Um, and let's see, Mayor Cahill, would you like to go first? Sure. Um, Thank you. It, it's good to see everybody. I just want to want to say that. Um, you know, I guess we'll look a little, we'll look different. You know, we're not, we're not there. Um, I think we, you know, we recognize that um, not, not everybody can see themselves in every part of our, our community, you know, be it public sector, private sector, uh, business, nonprofit, government. Um, so, you know, one thing, it's not everything, but one thing is that it, it, it needs to, we will look more organically like our community than we have for a long, than we really ever have. And do you, and I guess you're, you're probably very oriented towards our, you know, what our local government looks like, who, who's in city hall or working for the city. Is that kind of what you mean by will look, will reflect the community um, more organically? Yes, but more broadly than that, you know, I mean, for example, I, it was only fairly recently that I started, I used to think, well, we need more we need more people of color to stand in front of our students and teach them so that our kids of color can see people that look like them teaching. And then I, and then I realized, well, 
our white kids need to see people of color leading them and teaching them too. So, so no, it's not just um, it's not just who we have on staff in city government, but it certainly includes that, right? You know, we 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 need to we need to be able to get to a place where everybody and and we we talk about this when we talk about the work of the Human Rights Committee and you know one of my goals and in, in, in looking at who sits in those positions as appointed members of the Human Rights Committee is my hope is that every person in our community can start to see multiple different as aspects of themselves in the, in our Human Rights Committee and everybody in our community should be able to see multiple parts of themselves in in our whole community it, just across the board and business owners employees leaders of all types I, I, I don't know if I can express that any better but that's that's what I'm trying to get at yeah that, that's great and I I am um, I really appreciate that idea I think even um the things the and, and Kenan just said I it a heard. whole lot better than me, Counselor. I'm sorry. Maybe you want to read what Kenan said or, or, or call on her. I don't know. Um, oh, I'm getting called yeah. on. Go ahead, Estelle. You'll do yeah, a great job. Can... <laughs> I can read your words if you would like, Kenan. And her words say, absolutely. All children benefit from seeing educators of color normalized in settings of learning and school leadership. Absolutely. I do want to applaud Beverly, too, for the recent appointment of a DEI um, staffing position for uh, the schools. I think that's also a really critical step. I'm going to go on camera since I'm yeah. talking too much. Sorry. Um, <laughs> and sorry. Andre, uh, yeah, as you Andre know, diversification Morgan, is huge. Yeah, educator diversification is huge for the state of Massachusetts in general. But I think that um, certainly Beverly's taken a step in doing that. And, and representation matters as a phrase but it particularly in education, because this is where children see themselves as future educators and as successful people. Um, but to Julie's earlier point, educators oftentimes will not go where they're worried about being welcomed, right? So you have to consider the environment that you're attracting people to in the overall city environment. It's not just about your schools being welcoming, it's about wanting to live in that community and get to know the community. It's about feeling safe walking through the community, doing home visits, and all of that is about the climate overall, and that's how you also impact education and diversification um, and having that be normalized. And, and I think Beverly's approach to seeing it as a school, school effort, but is entrenched in the citywide effort is important and that's critical to it. I agree. If, Thank you so if, much if I for might add a, that. If I might add a bit to that as well, uh, I, I think- do uh, one. Oh. Okay, I, yeah. I think um, I, I was pleased to hear Mayor Cahill uh, indicate how he came to understand that uh, black uh, educators were an important part of white kids learning as well. And then Ken Ann added a lot to it, uh, but that goes to all professions. It is important that uh, a less diverse community like Beverly see black policemen uh, and all other professions. Uh, the, the, uh, white policemen will learn a lot uh, from an interaction with black policemen. Them, and women, Juan. And, and women, yes, <laughs> absolutely. And women. I know you meant that. <laughs> that thank you very much. <laughs> That's absolutely right. But, 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 but what we're really talking about is a diverse community uh, that reflects society, the greater society. And we learn from, from, from women, people of color in all of these professions. And I think it's important that they be represent, they, we uh, be represented in, uh, in, in all of the professions and that the communities begin to look more like society as a whole. Thank you, Juan. And I, I love that as an answer to what what does our community look like when we when we reach that NAACP vision, right? And and what I'm hearing so far is that it looks like people who have been marginalized and uh, 
for hundreds of years, our, our leaders will be present in all in all ver- variety of professions and public realms and not afraid to be part of the community um, just publicly as well. And um, Councillor Flowers, or Julie Flowers, would you like to add to that? <clears throat> um, sure. As I was listening and um, reflecting on what others have been sharing and appreciating it, um, the one thing that came to mind for me was a, a quote, actually, what someone said, it was at a, a conference that I was at professionally when I was first starting in ministry. And um, and it was a conference where part of it was hosted by an organization of women in ministry. And they were talking about work that had been accomplished. Um, the church I serve is an American Baptist church, so women can be ordained, and that's how I'm ordained. Some of you may be f- more familiar with Southern Baptists, where women, it's really can't be ordained still, although there are exceptions. Um, But it's still not as common to find women in ministry, even in American Baptist churches. And so what they were saying is, we have made great progress. We've done some work, but until it is the norm and not the exception, until it's as usual to see a woman in the pulpit as to see someone who identifies as male in the pulpit, then we have work to do. And so I've been pondering that as I've been listening to these reflections about our community, because part of it for me is that I, I think when we have achieved that, those goals that you were talking about, Estelle, when we've really worked and gotten to the point that our community truly reflects all of us and is really a place where people can feel safe and welcomed and unafraid then it will also start, I I agree with what Mayor Cahill said about representation. And I also think then the next step will be when it is, when it's the norm and not, and it's not exceptional. You know, when we, when we've gotten to that point, then I think that we'll really have, um, have known that we, the work will never be done. I think we'll, we'll want to continue to continue to work to respect and to welcome each other. But I think that will be, that will be a, a marked um, moment. You know, I also think a lot about, I had jotted down a few thoughts, but I also think a lot about our leaders and our teachers and, and who, who society tells us has authority or importance. You know, those are some of the examples. Those people will look like all, like all of us. And we talked about our children, Kanan wisely said, you know, and Mayor Cahill, that all children benefit, all people benefit from seeing many different types of people in leadership roles. Um, and you know, seeing ourselves reflected as, as a mirror, but also seeing people who are unlike us, windows through which we see and get to understand and learn more about other people and what's possible. I also was thinking, Estelle, one of the, one of the points that you mentioned was youth engagement. So I was thinking about in our high schools for our older youth, um, seeing leadership roles and clubs and organizations there also looking more like all of the, the diverse student body that um, is part of our schools. And so I think for helping our youth to reflect what we're talking about that we hope we as adults can reflect. Um, I saw, I noticed that Lorinda made a, a comment here in the chat about also making making sure that Beverly is affordable and accessible for people who want to call it home. And I just wanted to lift that up and echo that. And for people, for people who work in our community, I think, um, Juan made a great point about all the different types of community jobs and leaders and people who make up a community. And so I think about that part of building a community where we really feel like people can feel at home is making sure that people who work here in Beverly in all types of positions can afford to call it home. Because I think our community is is stronger and richer when people don't don't have to come here to work but go elsewhere because they are essentially priced out. Or, um, you know, we, we know that there have been many, many years of systemic, systemic racism um, based decisions that have made it harder for people of color to be able to access different communities, right? And so I think undoing, undoing those years of history is part of helping a community to also become accessible. So those were some of some of the thoughts that came to mind for me as I was reflecting on that. I agree. And I think um, that's actually kind of a good lead in 
once we can, I mean, it's, it's kind of nice to start with that vision and now to come down to sort of the ground and to think about things like, you know, policy and elections and concrete action steps. Um, and that brings me to another question for Juan. We'll have um, maybe just one more question for panelists and then we'll open up the dialogue to for attendees to share stories and ask questions of the panelists as well. Um, so um, Mr. Cofield, with an election in our mostly rear view mirror, <laughs> um, talk to us about how um, NAACP is working and will continue to work with local, state, and federal issues, federal officials on issues like at federal advocacy, economic opportunity for our black and brown neighbors? Sure. Uh, it, it might be helpful if I begin by telling you a bit about the structure of the NACP, and that becomes very, poor, very important in the sort of the division of labor. Uh, there are roughly 2,200 units, units being made, branches and the various uh, youth units, college chapters, uh, high school chapters, and youth councils. There are roughly 2,200 units across the country. And that's what really makes a difference and separates the NAACP from other civil rights organizations and why uh, we think that we are uh, by far uh, the, the most effective civil rights organization in the country. We're also the oldest and the largest. Um, is the broad network across the country of units that can be mobilized uh, in, in when the condition calls for it. And this recent election was a case in which uh, the units across the country uh, were asked to step forward and get out the vote. Uh, we are bi bi bipartisan and we, we don't promote uh, individual candidates or parties. And I know this is a democratic <laughs> town committee, uh, but uh, we, we stand tall on policy issues. Uh, as I began to say, that a major difference between the NACP and any other civil rights organization is, the, is our broad network across the country. Um, realistically, I don't know if we are any smarter uh, we uh, or, or do anything any better than other major civil rights organizations, advocacy organizations, but nobody else has the network than we did, which can, which can be very effective. And a major campaign for the NACP for the last, I'm going to say the last nine or 10 months has been around civic engagement, uh, registering people to vote and then helping to motivate them to get out to vote. And I think we did a, a very effective job. We are, we are pleased with the work that, that we did, uh, which was really important to us. Uh, we, we, we clearly recognize that, that one party uh, has uh, gotten the support uh, when people, when we, when we talk about policy issues uh, over another party uh, but we haven't had to to say that in those terms because as a as the NACP being a 501 c three, that's not what we're supposed to do anyway. So um, but I, but it it's clearly uh, talking about policy issues we'll do uh, all day and all night. and we can't do an effective job uh, of advocacy around issues and moving the society closer to the to the gold of this country uh, if we're not talking about policy issues. And I really like that your what came to your mind first when you thought about how you're connecting on with you know local state and federal government is basically to put the power in the people's hands um, engage in policy, but get people active and engaged in voting. Yes, and I had started talking about the the the, um, the, the structure of the NACP. Uh, at the top is the board of directors. 
uh, and under the board of directors are state conferences. And state conferences are the governing and coordinating entity for that particular jurisdiction. And in almost all cases, uh, the jurisdiction of a state conference is a particular state, like the Connecticut State Conference, the New York State Conference. Having said that, and there are 38 of them, having said that there are five sections in the country in which there are so few branches in a state that they've combined several states to form an area conference. NEAC is one of those five. We look and function just like a state. We just have more states in our jurisdiction. And NEAC happens to have more states in its jurisdiction than any other area conference. Uh, and then there are branches and branches function at the local level. And they are responsible for, they have jurisdiction and authority to advocate with local communities, towns, cities, and towns. State conferences uh, in its jurisdictional, in, in its advocacy responsibility, have a responsibility for that state, a particular state. Uh, and so we are interacting with the state legislators, the governor. And at the national level, uh, under the board of directors, is the Washington Bureau. And the Washington Bureau is primarily, or can be seen as the lobbying arm for the NAACP for federal legislation. And so I should not, as a state conference president, I should not be going up lobbying uh, with uh, the US senators and the legislators. Uh, that's the responsibility and the authority of the of the Washington Bureau. It also helps okay. to ensure that we're speaking with one voice. I'm not saying something different sense. than somebody else is saying in somebody else. I, I probably so, told you when you. No, uh, actually, I'm sorry, that really was a little long winded. I, I think that was a perfect answer. And, okay. um, and also, that made me aware as a city councilor, I know that I can look to directly interact with our new North Shore branch. So, Absolutely. and that's, that's the appropriate place for me and the, and the mayor and Council of Flowers to be um, looking to for the advocacy work and for support and um, so thank you. Yes, absolutely correct, <laughs> um, thank you. Yeah, thanks. Uh, mayor Cale, this would be maybe a great opportunity to see, to hear from you on what, on the details of what kinds of things and policy you're putting into place for the city of Beverly in terms of action towards anti-racism and um, equity. Sure, I'll just give a quick update. First, I, I do want to say, uh, you know, Council of Flowers welcomed Dr. Morgan earlier, and, and it's great to see him. I also want to point out that Dr. Trochik, our Superintendent of Schools has been in the meeting listening in tonight as well. She Thank does you. great work on our behalf. Um, so yeah, we th there are several things that people in Beverly have heard are coming and I wanna make sure you know they're coming. So um, first is um, we're, we're putting together a race equity task force and it's, it's put together. And tomorrow there'll be a press release going out. Uh, it's, I think it's about a 28 member group um, we've worked real hard to try to make it a, a group that uh, is, is well representative of the community and ready to do some serious work. Um, I've talked a number of times with Mayor Driscoll because Salem's a, a couple of months ahead of us in, in terms of having named a task force and started the work of it. Um, but we all know that there are important conversations that need to happen in Beverly and progress that needs to be made. And while the task force won't be solely responsible for that, it's a group that we're putting together to run over a several month course of time to help us uh, you know, lay out some, um, uh, a course to follow. In partnership with that, um, counselors Rand and Flowers, I think you folks know well that they're both fantastic um, leaders in our community and they've been working closely with me on, on, on pretty much all of this. Um, we together, set aside $150,000 in this current fiscal year budget uh, in the city budget for a few things. One is an equity audit that we'll be undertaking that will be, we'll be um, hiring a consultant to do so. And that'll be separate from, but really um, kind of arm in arm and complementary to the work of the task force. Uh, and so the task force will be, you know, interacting with those consultants and helping to kind of drive that work. 
Um, so that'll be happening in the coming months. Um, we created the position of equity, diversity, and inclusion director, a position that'll be housed in the mayor's office. And we are just about to start interviews. Uh, the job's been posted for a few weeks, put together, put together a team to work on um, vetting resumes and first round interviews. There'll be two rounds of interviews and, and we hope to have the position hired and the person on board in the coming weeks. Um, what else can I say? Um, oh, trainings. Another thing that we'll be spending the, the initiative money on is trainings. Councillor Rand and Leah Jones, who's here, who just recently stepped down as chair of our Human Rights Committee, but is still on the committee, thank the Lord. Um, the, the Human Rights Committee as a group, and especially um, uh, Leah, along with Councillor Rand, came to me and, and said, you've got to spend some money on some training. So they, uh, they didn't they offered a little money and then they said, you got to put the rest of it up. So we, we did a training with a group called Community Change Inc. It was an anti-racism training. We did one in August uh, with a number of, of uh, city department heads, uh, members of both our police and fire departments, some school administration representation, members of our human rights committee. Went really well. We now are doing two more trainings uh, with that organization in the coming weeks. And, and, and the trainings are for city staff, city board and committee volunteers and our elected officials, city councilors, school committee. Um, and so we've got a couple more trainings lined up now and we'll see where we go from there. We, we figure as many as four or five trainings during this fiscal year. Uh, just to, again, it's, this is all about starting to move the needle, right? We've, we've got a lot, a lot of work to do. Uh, and the last thing I'll mention right now is I'd made a commitment uh, back in early June that we in Beverly, like a lot of communities, would review our police department's use of force policy. We've been spending a lot of time on that. I promise to get it out there publicly so the community can look at it, digest it, have some conversation around it. And that'll be coming out, I keep saying very soon and things keep getting, um, um, well, there's so many things that are happening these days, not to complain, but we are busy, but we're gonna get the press release out in the task force tomorrow, trying to get the use of force document out sometime next week so people can start to digest it and think think it through and then we can have a dialogue about it. So just a few of the things that are going on. Thank you, Councilor, for that time. That's great. Thank you, Mayor Cahill. Um, will the, it, just to clarify for myself actually, will the task force be connecting with the Human Rights Committee at all? Very much so. And I think there are as many as four or so Human Rights Committee members who are going to be part of the task force. So yeah, yes. The, I mean, there, there are so many synergies here, right? And, and this is meant, the other thing is the task force meetings will be uh, publicly noticed, posted and, and available for people to attend. Um, so that, I mean, that's, that's the only great. way to do it. So, yep, thanks. That's uh, definitely one of the benefits of Zoom actually. Um, uh, Mayor, Mayor Cahill, if, if I might, uh, mm -hmm. a, as you might assume, um, Criminal justice has been a major part of our advocacy. Don't, don't get in front of the camera. Like no, 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 okay. Uh, has been a major part of our advocacy uh, for the, the last year. Pr prior to this year, NEAC's primary focus had been one, uh, in, in education and two, economic development. Uh, and I'm proud to say that NEAC has, has had significant input in the uh, state legislation, uh, the bills that are before the conference committee today um, uh, dealing with uh, policing. Uh, but there's a document that the, that, the, uh, that the New England Area Conference has produced uh, that deals with issues of policing as it pertains to the state level and issues that pertain to the local level. I will ask the branch president to make sure that she gets a copy of that in your hands right away. Absolutely, and thank you for, for mentioning that. Thanks. Yes. Uh, one, one other thing I should say um, is that we we try to put a lot of emphasis on training with our, with our police department. And we have, again, the, the council and I together have increased repeatedly the training budget each year. Uh, and I know that we, you know, we were looking at what the trainings look like, what they encompass and entail. And I know that at the local level, police departments are somewhat waiting on the results of the conference committee work 
on that reform bill because there there's a lot in there about you know what are some of the ways in which in which training you know what are the right ways to train what are the things that need to be trained consistently and kind of in an ongoing fashion thanks yes thank you thank you <clears throat> um i i'd like to just ask julie flowers one more question as a panelist and then we'll get in some other questions from from all of you um i guess just kind of to bring it back to sort of like the, the real results of taking action um as a mother uh it's i know it's important for for you that your child the himself and others and and um, the community kind of how we were talking before about um, what does it look like when we have reached a certain point in a vision that includes um, equity right so how do you how do you what would you give us as advice as, as just people out in the community how do we help bring small small actions to our daily lives and our, maybe our, our, you know, local professions um, of anti-racism. What are some of the small steps that you see that make a difference in a child's life or in, in an adult's life, but um, something small that you can kind of guide us to, to do out when we're out in our communities? Thank you. Um, yeah, for those, for those of you who don't know my son, he is half Japanese. And so I think, you know, when Estelle's talking about him seeing himself represented in the community too, he doesn't look exactly like me. And so, um, you know, and as I think about his classmates at school, I grew up in Beverly and I can say, you know, Beverly is still not as racially and ethnically diverse as many of our neighbors. We know that but when I look at Emmett's class at school, it's also a much more diverse class than I ever had in Beverly. And to me, that's such a hopeful, positive thing. Um, and so I guess, you know, Estelle's asking about, you're asking about my perspective as a mom or small things. So if it's okay, I'll tell you just a short story about, um, it does bring us back to schools. I know we kind of keep coming to um, kids in schools, but I think it's applicable then across age groups. Um, and I do want to say, Dr. Churchuk, I'm sorry for not uh, noticing you were in the call too when I mentioned Dr. Morgan. There's so many people on the call. Um, but I, in my, in my mom role, my mom hat on, I get to have the honor of working as part of the PTO for Hannah's school. And my role is to help the PTO bring arts and enrichment programs from outside that supplement the, the education that happens in our classrooms. And so part of that role then also... Um, which is look, it looks very different this year with COVID than it has in the past. But um, part of that role is then to help the school community understand what are the programs that are coming and help them talk to their children about what programs have been in their classroom. And um, it's, it's designed to help supplement and support the work that educators are doing in the classroom. And so then part of my role is to send you know, a flyer home to talk about um, what program your child saw that day. And so the story that I want to tell that I think it's such a small thing, but you know, I think Estelle, as you're asking about small ways that each one of us maybe can think in our lives. Um, and again, I say that particularly um, for those of us with white skin, that the system has privileged, you know, we're thinking about helping to create in Beverly a more actively anti-racist community. Um, I, I think it's, it's trying to shift our lens so that we are realizing that we, we don't notice even all the ways in the course of a day that the, that society or that the system reflects to us, tells us, shows us that we are welcome and comfortable and that we belong. And so I think when we begin to notice and try to notice where are the ways and spaces and places that other people then are being told that they don't belong then we can exert some power in our own small ways on how we can shift that narrative. So my, my story, my small example, and then people can extrapolate, maybe think about ways that we can apply that in our work lives or um, in our day-to-day -day life. But 
I was making a flyer for one of the programs that we have at Hannah School. And it's, the, it's Crazy Chemistry Night is the program. But the flyer that I was making, it's for first and second graders. And, um, and on the flyer, I was just looking, you know, for clip art to include, make it kind of cute and fun. And the, the image that I started to grab was just, you know, the first one that came up. And it was two white children doing something with chemistry equipment. And then I realized putting that on the flyer was going, what sends a message. It tells every child who looks at it something. It, and, you know, as, as uh, was mentioned earlier, Kanan made the point and others that it doesn't just tell our children of color something about who they are and who the school says they are. It tells the white children something about who they are and who society says they are. And so I ended up shifting gears and was able to, um, send home a flyer that showed multiple children, black and brown children, white children, male identifying, female identifying in appearance, together doing chemistry. And that's such a small, that's such, well, it sounds like a small shift, but, but I hope that also we can start to see it as more than a small shift. Because I think when we can look for ways that we begin to, to change that narrative and say, that it isn't just about reflecting back the people that society has said have power. It's about giving power and then reflecting that broadly. Um, and, you know, I think the other, the other program that I just want to mention that I think had that kind of an impact is one of the programs, one of the first programs I brought to Hannah was through an organization called YAMA, which is Young Audiences of Massachusetts. And they it, it have an amazing breadth of arts programs. And so we had a program um, at, that we brought and it was um, a hip hop dance group. And what they were doing was talking about the history of hip hop as it then was related to um, ELA standards, English language art standards in Massachusetts core curriculum. And so it, it's probably still my favorite program that I've helped to bring to Hannah. And what I, what I remember thinking as I was watching it is that the power of that program, again, was not just that children of color saw presenters being lifted up as you know, people in authority, people with worth, people with value, people the school was bringing in to show them have value, but for our white students also to be understanding that and to be learning about their English and language arts requirements by understanding and appreciating the beauty of the history of hip hop something that might be outside of their their sort of usual scope it feels like those are the kinds of shifts that we can make where we begin to help shift the standard around what society has tried to tell us is um is the norm because because there isn't we, we need to get to the point where they're the norm that's had power that that standard that's what needs to shift so I guess those are my stories about a couple of small examples. I, I think it'd be interesting to think together about how we can extrapolate that into as adults into our lives um, and start to shift, shift those lenses and, um, and learn from people whose experiences are different from ours, learn from our friends and neighbors of color. And, um, and I'm going to stop now with a comment that I think is very appropriate that I stopped because I was going to say, and the other thing is I think, um, learning when we need to pass the learning when learning when our role as allies is to help amplify voices of color and learning when our role is to help pass the microphone. And I think that's where I see Beverly really that's our that's the shift. Um, we have amazing leaders of color in our community that I learn from and I'm just eager to continue to learn from them and follow their lead. Likewise, thank you for sharing thank that you. story with us. And I, I like to think about my role as a city councilor and a community leader here too, as not only um, helping to facilitate shifting, but actually creating space for people, for other voices, for new leadership, for um, space for conversations like these to happen. Um, and so thank you for allowing me to ask you the panelists questions and guide you in some of those thoughts. And I would like to open up some dialogue here. We have a lot of really, you know, here's 
as, as I'm reading kind of the private questions coming into me, I know I am in the company of advocates and politically active people because <laughs> people want data, they want stats, they want to know more about how to affect change. This is a really powerful group of people here that I can tell you're you're not um, you're not going to leave this meeting and do nothing. So thank you just right now for all of your passion and the actions that I know you're going to take every day to um, work towards anti-racism. Um, I want to just acknowledge also school committee member Lorinda Visnick is here and um, uh, city councilor Scott Houseman, Ward 4 city councilor Scott Houseman is here uh, and we have Let's see, did I, how many people did I miss? That's the trouble when you start doing this. We have a great, great turnout from our um, Beverly Democratic City Committee, of course. Um, and if, um, I don't wanna put you too much on the spot, but Dr. Morgan, if you're here, this would be just a lovely audience for you just to say hello if, if you would like to. Um, and if not, I respect that. I'm not sure if you're still here. I am. Yay. Thank you. <laughs> nice to meet you, Dr. Morgan. Good welcome to, meet to Beverly. You as well. Thanks so much for the warm welcome in to each of you. I'm excited to be a part. Uh, thank you for uh, uh, opening your arms and opening up your hearts to me as I join the community and we partner together in this work. And so I'm looking forward to the collaboration and to our work together. Likewise. Thank you. Um, and did you have any other little tidbits you want to leave us with? If not, that's totally fine. I just want to give you the space if you if you would like it. And so I, I think I will add uh, to the conversation and Councilwoman Flowers, thanks so much uh, for raising this to the issue. And I heard you say a little earlier in the conversation that it's important to stay at the table in dialogue and in conversation. And I think that that becomes so inherent just in terms of the uh, small action items to our daily lives, which I heard is one of the questions. You know, it's, I think that's where it starts is being able to uh, engage in difficult conversations around difference and be able to stay at the table while you're having it. The problem is, is that, you know, many of us are apprehensive about having those conversations because in some regards we're afraid that we might say the wrong thing or it might not be received in the uh, manner of intentionality for which that for which a comment is made or for which a statement uh, is oriented but I think being able to talk about difference very very openly and honestly and even if we don't agree around what our experiences are or what our beliefs are um, I think if we can learn how to sit at the table in civility, um, that's a small act uh, that can really open up dialogue to, uh, to a plethora of other things. And so, you know, part of where I hope the um, support and the collaboration for us all could be is around that idea of really how do we have, how do we begin to have and continue to have conversations that are uncomfortable um, that offers opportunities for us to learn intricately about our, about each other and our differences um, and how we can move the needle in terms of uh, becoming a more equitable and anti-racist uh, community. Thank you. Thank you for those words of wisdom and support. And uh, I'm so looking forward to continuing working with you. That goes both ways. Yeah, good. I'm excited. Um, let me just see, uh, Dr. Turochek, and I guess I'm putting, you know, a number of city officials on the spot. I can't leave you out. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you. Thanks for uh, inviting me to join. Um, I'm just, I'm happy to be here. I, I'm glad Andre got an opportunity to introduce himself to all of you. Um, he's been a, an essential part of our uh, moving forward in our plan um, 
from some professional development that we've already provided to every teacher in Beverly, every staff member in Beverly um, around implicit bias and around some of the other anti-racist racist information that, you know, we not haven't had a lot of training on in Beverly for our teaching staff. So we acknowledge the conversation that you had earlier about the importance of students seeing themselves in teachers. We know that's an area that we need to work on, um, but we also feel like it's important that we provide training to the teachers that we do have on staff so that they become more aware of their impact on students and what they bring into the classroom as they start their teaching. So, um, you know, as a school district, we're really excited to be able to be working in a very proactive way, make sure that we're addressing um, things that really need to be addressed and that probably um, are long overdue. So I'm really excited to be here and thanks for letting me have a chance to speak. Thank you, Dr. Trocek. And I, I love that we're starting to center these conversations both in our professional development settings in school and at City Hall and um, with our curriculum as well. And I know the school committee ha is passionate about this as well. So thank you to the school committee for, for continuing to advocate. Um, I, I'm going to do my best at um, calling on attendees to share a story or ask a question. We've had a number of questions kind of coming in through the chat. Um, and so I'm trying to be also be mindful that we have about ten, technically 10 minutes left of our event. Um, and I'd like to call on um, Nelda Quigley, who would like to share a story, an experience with us, if you're still here. Okay, now you are. Hello. <laughs> Hi. Uh, obviously, I'm not Nola, that's my wife, but uh, as so much of our life, uh, a lot of things I do, uh, she's responsible for. Anyway, uh, actually, she told me about the meeting tonight, and uh, it's been part of my whole day. Uh, I made contact with someone uh, in the history racism uh, unit that is putting something together for the elementary schools. So I'm very excited about that. And I expect to meet and talk and have further discussion. But the conversation tonight for 20 years, and I, I am not checking out until I do something to help the elementary schools get a, a good pay. I am losing um, as a, a veteran uh, and as a teacher in there now. Yeah. Okay. I want to make just a few comments. I understand the fact you only have a little bit of time, but um, one okay. is as a, as a father and I I think, I think it's important when you have children, if you, you introduce your child to, to the point where children, because children are more acceptable of, of other children. They don't come in with uh, uh, pre-configured ideas and, and, and details. So introducing your children as many times and, and in as many ways as you can with other children, and it doesn't matter what they look, what they color they are. The other point that I wanted to make was uh, I grew up in a neighborhood in New York City, actually. It was a, it was a veteran neighborhood, and uh, rather it was a, a minority neighborhood, lots of different minorities from Europe. But we didn't have any African-American people. I didn't really know any African-American people. Uh, and so the first time I met African-American people was when I went in the Navy. I became a, I, I joined the Navy. And I was on a ship and it was really interesting because one third of the members on my ship were minority. And there's a, there was a, a, an opportunity where you, you work together, you, you live together, you eat together, you go on liberty together and you learn. Uh, some of my best friends were on the ship. And what, was a, what really was another lesson, one of my best friends, an African-American kid from Oklahoma, called me up when he was getting discharged and said, Mr. Quigley, I want to come meet you. I'm getting out. I said, great. 
And then I realized I couldn't have him come meet me in my neighborhood. So it was another lesson. And the last lesson was when I, I started to uh, get into college, I realized I loved anthropology. So I went on and, be, and be, got my graduate degree and a postgraduate degree. And I've been teaching anthropology for 18 years. And the subject I teach most fervently is race and racism. There's a lot of, I'm not going to say right now, but I want to say you have to start learning the lesson as early as possible, which is why if you're going to figure it and it can be made realistic, and I have some things, I'm not going to mention them here, but they're totally reduce the idea of race because it doesn't exist, and therefore you shouldn't have it as a keystone for racism. So I'll stop there. I hope you're all interested in finding out some more. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Quigley, and um, I, I appreciate um, you flipping that thought in there of the, the construct of race. I really appreciate yeah. that. Um, yes. I'd love to hear now from um, Dr. Robinson. I believe you had your hand up. If you're still here. Let's see. Uh, let me see if Dr. Robinson is still here. And while I'm looking, I just wanted to also point out that members of the Human Rights uh, Committee, oh, Esther uh, Nagoso I, and Lee yeah, Jones um, are here. Okay, she's here, good. Uh, you're breaking up, unfortunately. I think she's dropped off. Okay, I'm sorry about that. Um, come so back if you that, can. Uh, okay, I hope so. This, that can be the problem with um, what we're all trying to do here, but I'd say successfully connecting, even though, uh, you know, we can't do it in person. Maybe you can see. do another quick um, try now. I mean, if it's any clearer, I can jump in now. I know there's other people on the line. Yeah, no, you're great. We waited for you, Dr. Robinson, welcome. Thank you for that. And um, I'm so happy to participate in this call. I uh, serve under Natalie Bowers as her first VP in the NAACP, and I'm a, a sociologist. And I wanted to just link the parts of this conversation, which have been so helpfully directed towards the education of children, which is really about adding something into the experiences of people who are forming their understandings of themselves, the world and others to part of the work of anti-racism on the other end of the age spectrum, which is sometimes or often about removing something. And this concept of the audit, uh, of which we had such a nice demonstration in, in the discussion about putting together a flyer, where you kind of self audit and you think, what are the presumptions that I have here as I go about doing this work of putting this together? There was a comment um, by Elizabeth in the chat around initiatives for, um, senior people. And I, I just think that all along the spectrum of residents of a place from an age point of view, you know, you saw me make a, a gentle intervention um, with my colleague Juan Cofield, who I have great respect for along the dimensions of, of gender identification. And so I, 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 uh, I just wanted to make sure that we recognize that that, that anti-racism work spans um, across all of the age spectrum and that the the kind of non-judgmental self-audit where you suspend the idea that you might possibly be a racist in favor of just an open and non-judgmental investigation of the assumptions that you, you make in daily life. As a person of color who's recently moved to the North Shore, my challenging interactions have been with, with older people uh, who have made you know, assumptions about um, why I'm a professor at Northeastern, because they have to diversify their faculty and just a lot of kind of casual comments in that regard that has suggested to me that, that there's work to be done on the North Shore, perhaps in particular, because uh, it is such a predominantly white community in just raising awareness about, about um, anti-racism as a, as a practice. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for your um, your leadership on the North Shore chapter of the NAACP. And 
as I learned tonight, I can look forward to working with you directly to help affect change in, in my city. So thank you. And, and um, I guess I would just like to personally welcome you to the North Shore. Um, thank you for pointing out that, thank you. that idea of a, of a self audit. And that did, you know, play on what Julie brought into to with her very, very kind of small action, but how many people will that affect like that? How does that ripple out and help people to understand that there's not one type of student, there's not one type of teacher or, you know, we, we need to drop that, um, the idea of dominant culture and embrace culture as a community instead of looking for dominance. Um, yeah, self-audit without fragility. We've had some, some also some questions, uh, like I said, I, this, I can tell I'm in company of activists and advocates because I've had questions pertaining to data of um, specifically within the schools and data specifically with, within the police department. And I think those are all, you know, I, I'm glad that Mayor Cahill touched on the police department a little bit. And I'm glad that Dr. Trocek touched a little bit on what the schools are doing. I think, um, I think, you know, we, we need to keep asking those questions and find ways to have those questions heard in public forums and also to get answers. So um, I appreciate all of the energy that this group is putting towards those kinds of questions and answers. Um, and so I see that we are basically right at 8.30. Uh, let's see. Um, and I'm gonna, so Hannah, I, I see lots of people are putting in different resources and kind of answering, we have this whole separate little dialogue. Please excuse my, my grandmother clock is chiming. Um, and I wanted you all to make sure that some of the biggest resources that we kind of saw come across the chat are um, the North Shore branch of the NAACP, which is now fully formed. And thanks to Juan Cofield's leadership on that and a huge thanks to um, the co-founders um, and all of you members who many of you are here today. So you can get involved by becoming a member of the NAACP and Lauren on Q has shared the link <laughs> it's very easy. I did it this afternoon <laughs> to become a member. Um, there was also, I saw coming through the chat, a, uh, a local group that is helping elders and working with diversity. Um, if you wanted to put that link back in the chat, now would be a good time. Um, the Beverly Human Rights Committee meets every other month on Thursdays and their meetings are public as well. Even if you're not serving as a member on that committee, you can volunteer, you can get involved with conversations. You can find their information on the um, city of Beverly website. If you look around a bit and then they also have a Facebook page. Um, Esther, did you want to give any, maybe a, last kind of comment or thought to share with us about your your role here in the community or the Human Rights Committee? Uh, well, I wasn't going to say anything because what I yeah. I would like to say, I, I don't know how it would be perceived, but what I feel as I listen to everybody talk is that there is too much emphasis on training, on training to achieve racial inequality. I'd rather we use that money for training to employ more people of color. To me, training perpetuates 
the same white privilege and the same inequalities we are trying to end. People of color are not trained to navigate this system. So why are white people being trained to navigate through what we are trying to do? They have to figure it out themselves. That's my position and, and I, I, I'm sorry, I feel a little bit upset, but uh, that is what I feel. Please do not apologize, Esther. And you know, I, I had a feeling that you would have a twist that we all needed to hear. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, thank you. And yeah. also I came across a picture today of um, you and Councillor Flowers and I from when you ran for city council at large. Okay. It was, you know, Facebook reminded me it was uh, whatever, three years ago today. And, um, and it made me smile and think about your, your bravery to do something. Picture Beverly three years ago. It, it was not in as good of a place as it is right now. And Esther was really bold to stand up and to run. And as you can tell, I'm always ready to convince her to do it again. <laughs> Okay, so, um, so can somebody can with you? Okay, can somebody explain to me uh, uh, why we need the training? Because I have said that before. I think I said it in a meeting where, where I was with Mayor Cahill, if you can remember. And I was saying that um, I don't feel like people need to be trained to um, to figure out how to add system. I think. Um, people have to figure it out. It will take a long time. There'll be a lot of conflict. Um, people will make mistakes, but there is no need to avoid those mistakes because avoiding them hinders the very success that we are trying to look for. So, and I remember one, I, once I was in a meeting with you, I think it was you and Julie Flowers, and I gave an example of the Ali explorers, uh, when they started from Christopher Corobas, when he started, started from Spain, wherever Portugal, wherever he was, he did not know where he was going. He had no map, he had no information. But what he did, he made two boats uh, so that if one capsizes, they have another one. And he gathered um, a good team and all the things that he thought he needed on the tree. In fact, one of the boats capsized and he remained with one. And they set out without knowing where they were going, believing they were going to the far east. And they ended up discovering something better than what they wanted originally, which was the Americas. So I don't think we should be frightened by what we are setting out to explore, let's go. I mean, wherever, so long as we believe in each other, so long as we have the right teams, so long as we have what we need, we should not worry about making mistakes. That, that, that is what I feel. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that so honestly. And I, I hope you know this is a safe space and that your comment will be um, something that people, everyone here is considering right now. Why are we spending money on training? Why can't the white people in city hall just do that work by themselves at home? I think there are a lot of answers to that question. And um, I, don't, I don't know that there's a right answer to that question. I think there's a, there's a range of, of places where people are coming from. And I guess as policymakers, it's really important to consider how can we have the most effect on, on that range? How can we bring people to the point of functionality when it comes to acting in an anti-racist way? Um, and thank you, Dominic. here. I just saw that he left an awesome comment in the chat too. Dominic is a great community voice for us to listen to right now. Um, He's saying, I agree with her to a point. We must stay focused on the core goal at hand, which is to shift the dynamic of the African-American experience here in America to empower those who need it most. 
training is important if we're not developing the leadership and economic reality of black and brown folks, in particular African-Americans to create true equity, then we have failed. So, um, so this group is interested in creating true equity. And um, as Rodney, a little way back, Rodney, who was, is the, uh, the chair, I believe, of the outreach committee of the Beverly Democratic City Committee, put in the chat when the Democratic City Committee meets and that everyone is welcome. And so that, that's the committee that was, is responsible for this dialogue tonight. I think we have a very special Democratic City Committee that is interested in engaging the community in broader dialogue on, on issues that we all care about um, that, that cross party lines. Um, at least they should cross party lines. That's my own little dig there. But um, they do cross party lines and we can all care about them. And as a community, we can build these issues. I, I have the, um, the pleasure of being a nonpartisan elected official. So I, I can really honestly say this is something that I know as a city councilor, we are all working towards. So um, we've gone over about 10 minutes. And so I want to thank you for spending that extra time with me and for being here today. I hope that you've made some connections with new community people. I hope you're coming away from this um, thinking, inspired, ready to take action and, you know, ready to follow up with the, the questions that you didn't get answered tonight. I'm available to um, and uh, any elected official, our information is very public. It's on the city website. Um, please, please ask me, Councilor Flowers, Mayor Cahill, Dr. Trocek, school committee members, um, city councilors, please approach us with your questions, with your ideas. Um, get involved with the Democratic City Committee, um, support, is uh, the NAACP. Uh, this has been really wonderful for me, and I hope you've enjoyed your experience tonight. Thank you, Juan Cofield, for being here tonight and for your continued efforts to bring equity to New England. <laughs> I'm just thinking about Beverly. You're like New England, so thank you. I really well, appreciate it. Thank you so much, and thank you to the City Democratic committee uh, and uh, we will make ourselves available when you need us or would like to have us again. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you, Councillor Flowers, for being here tonight and Mayor Cahill for letting me put you on the spot. I appreciate that. Um, Rodney, is there anything you'd like to share as we wrap this evening up? Yeah, first of all, thank you, Councilwoman. Rand, uh, you did a fantastic job tonight and thank you to the, the panelists out there. We really appreciate this. Uh, the Beverly City Democratic Committee, really we're, we're just trying to be a convener, bring folks together, uh, make sure that you have a platform for information and, and for um, knowing who people are so you can reach out to them. Um, and so what we'll do is we will put a copy of this chat on our website as well as a recording of this event. So feel free to go back uh, if you missed something or if you wanted to reconnect with somebody, feel free to do that. You can also email me as well. Uh, it's rodney.b.sinclair at gmail.com. I put that into the chat. I don't know if you got it or not, um, but you know, feel free to e email me and, and connect. Again, we'd love to have you as part of the Democratic Committee, um, but if we can just point you in the right direction to get the information that you need, Ultimately, that's what we're here for. So thank you so much. And the outreach committee, um, Hannah Bowen behind the scenes, making this thing work. Uh, nothing can work without Hannah. So we want to thank you so much and all the other, other uh, outreach members. We really, really appreciate it. I am, um, I'm sorry to, to say one more thing. I just realized because we do have a bit more of a diverse group here than I oh, am privileged to have like audience for normally i wanted to announce very quickly that because and because this is the city committee um there are some two kind of odd openings 
in the in city government right now. One is an opening coming up for Ward 6 city councillors. And um, please, it, it, all that's needed is a letter of interest. So you would need to write a letter of interest and send it in to the city clerk if you would like to fill that seat for one year. Um, if there, I'm sure you have questions if you're interested in that, just ask me offline. And the second is the Ward 2 school committee seat is in a very similar position. We had two resignations in our city government this year. Um, the Ward 2 city uh, school committee seat is open as well and also just requires a letter of interest sent to the superintendent, I believe. So uh, this is a great audience to spread that word. We need, this is a great opportunity to see some new faces reflect in, in like diversity, black and brown people reflected in our city government. So please spread the word on that. Okay, that was my last little tip. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. I hope you've had a wonderful evening. I can't wait to do this again. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, panelists Thank you. and participants. Thank you.